<laughs> yeah. You guys could be the judge of it. I could tell Francis liked it. He was yeah. I was gonna say, God, Scott, Scott, dancing dancing to Scott, you're just like dead eyed looking. At it. <laughs> I was I was mesmerized. It hypnotized me. Uh, Following the beat, it's it's not letting me share, right. Timmy. When yeah, it's giving me it, a hard time. Yeah, give it a try now. Okay, there we go. Am I sharing? Yep, yep, looks great. All right, hey everybody, welcome to Drawing High. We got a really fun night tonight. We got a couple of. A couple of guests have popped in, um, and uh, I'm excited. Uh, kind of past uh, Illustration Academy, as, as Cassandra said, we're all we're all come from the same family. Um, so, Drawing Hive. If you don't remember, it's brought to you by Visual Arts Passage. Uh, Visual Arts Passage offers online resources to help you develop careers in illustration and uh, in the fine arts world. So. This is going to be really good. I'm nervous about this because this is there, there's so much stuff going on here. <laughs> First of all, the topic tonight is the movie Twisters. And uh, so um, we, have, we have some good reference here. We wanted something really highbrow for Scott and Francis. Well, that's, you know, it, we're, we're nothing joking. but classiness here. Yeah. Glenn Powell, both these guys showed up for Glenn Powell. So, <laughs> yeah. And I said he's bummed, bummed out because he's got a flannel shirt on. Um, <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, uh, we're going to do, we'll be doing three poses, two 20 minute poses, and then a 40 minute pose. Um, people uh, with the camera on them may not follow the rules. <laughs> Uh, so you can you can draw whatever you want, panelists, uh, and anybody else can do whatever they want. Also, at the end of it, we share it on uh, Instagram, and it's it's a hoot. Uh, so many different versions, so many different things done. Um, so tonight, uh, for the for those of you who don't know, we extra faces. We were this this was the photograph you were talking about, Timmy. I mean, it, it's it represents it well. Yeah, I, I couldn't help. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Um, so, uh, France, this is Francis Vallejo. Uh, you may know him. You guy. may know him from Legends of the Fall. That's right. Yep. <laughs> um, Francis is a wonderful illustrator, bookmaker, great instructor, um, has done a uh, 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 couple of great books. He's uh, uh, actually won the uh, Boston Globe uh, Horn Book Award for the Best Picture Book for Jazz Day, and then has done a, a phenomenal book uh, with Neil Gaiman uh, for Fo Folio Society called the Anza. Uh, can you pronounce that for me, uh, Francis? Anansi Boys. Anansi Boys. I always, I, I, I'm never quite sure. Um, I, I know the pictures though; they're absolutely beautiful. Um, I have a, I have a few things in here, Francis. Uh, Francis and I met. 2005 i think 2006 yeah. uh, uh when we were doing the academy on ringling's campus and he was a student there uh he was this he, i could always identify him he was the student with the most paint on his uh person he had uh paint all over his clothes and his his body and um he looked like an art student and he truly was he was he was a great student and it's become a really, really great artist. Someone I'm very proud to say I had something to do with. Um, um, this is uh, some of Fran. I just pulled a few images of, of Francis's work, and it's phenomenal. Um, you started out in uh, wanting to be a, a cartoonist, right, or, or a comic artist. Um, yeah. Yep uh spawn comics and I, well i wanted to be like a, a rapper or a, or a, a basketball player and those didn't work out and i like <laughs> um and that's honest i i was too short um for basketball but i always like drawing so it definitely came from comics well you've you've landed in the right place my friend 
Well, it was when I went to the academy, truly, when uh, all I knew was Rockwell was great. And then all of a sudden I met I met and or seen people like we're just talking about Austin Briggs, Bernie Fuchs and Mark English and yourself and Gary Kelly. I'm like, oh, OK, this is how you can update some of the things Rockwell was doing with comics. Um, so I, I you, you said something to do with my journey, John, I think probably the most a single human has any ever impacted me would be yourself. Mm. Ooh. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, Francis uh, was not an easy student. <laughs> he was a tough <laughs> student. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 but uh, I had to, you know, he, he fought uh, back, back on ideas and, um, but he had an open mind um you just had to you just had to throw it at him a few times and uh you know showing him showing him different types of artists people that different things once he got and it's like I don't know how much I effect I had on it but once he was in the room with other artists that um that just were magnificent um I think he listened to them like I should be I got to open my world up a bit and he certainly did in um then the then the hardest part I had to do is talk him out of going to going to Russia. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's a whole cool. other story. <laughs> it's about time to draw, but hey, we have the uh, um, uh, Scott Anderson came in right at the, it, kind of last minute here, and I threw a couple of slides in for Scott. Scott's another uh, actually was at the academy before Francis, um, and somebody I've had contact with for many many years and has developed themselves. Um, in the illustration industry, become a very well-known illustrator, very well-known educator, and uh, just a phenomenal uh, I, I, illustrator, painter. But the thing that Scott did a little bit differently is he had his he kind of had his own timeline of he did things a little bit differently than Francis and Sterling. He he was methodical. And he had a plan <laughs> and uh, he stuck to it and really, really made it work. And, you know, it's funny, it's interesting how everybody kind of ends up at the same place. Um, and um, we can talk more about that. It's, it's time for us to draw. Both of you, thank you for being here. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more in just a minute. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. So uh, everybody, as John mentioned, please share your work throughout the night on Instagram. We're going to check it out at the end of the night. We are using the tags hashtag Hive Alley, like Tornado Alley, but Hive <laughs> Alley. Hashtag drawing Hive and at Visual Arts Passage. Um, get to drawing. We got 20 minutes on this first one. Um, that was fun. That was very sweet of you, uh, Francis. Um that was very nice of you to say we, that. Uh, yeah. You notice we're, it's, no, we're no strangers to crying and drawing hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised Scott didn't just throw me under the bus after that. <laughs> Scott, are you trying to switch your? I am. Yeah, yeah. There we go. I was like, I, had, I was like, I, I was like, I have. Of course, we would test this out. Then it would be a problem when we go live. No, I think it was just a fun fall asleep. So. I think the the best way probably to start tonight out is ask our uh, our new our new guys on the panel what are you working in tonight? Maybe you could start, Francis, by telling us what what's your what's going to be your method tonight? I mean, like what tools and mediums? Sure. Um, so I have a tendency to sometimes overdo the mixed media aspect. Um, so I wanted to go a little bit more in the the picture making realm. Um, so I'm going to do one piece. Uh, it was the one of the, I think the character with the split lighting more the portrait. So I'm going to actually do a number of comps just in marker, um, really playing with the design of the piece. Uh, and then I have some, um, gouache that I've been playing with. It's the same gouache that Studio Ghibli uses, but I got my, my palette here. So I'm going to do a comp. Uh, with marker and then uh, do a gouache piece. And I want this one to be a bit more graphic. If there's more time, I might take colored pencil to turn some form, but uh, that's the plan. So you're going to do the uh, figure in the cowboy hat? 
Yes. Yeah. Yep. I'm about to pull that one up right now, actually. I started drawing on that piece uh, before we came in. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something that I've been thinking about uh, a lot is is lighting. And I think I'm doubling down on the fact that I really like sculptural lighting, uh, generally with the singular light source. So as I was going through the, the reference, um, I was noting that a lot of these are a little bit more ambient. And like this, this one had um, a little bit more sculptural lighting, especially on this side of the face. But I thought to myself, I'm not sure, like this one could be fun to render, but out of the group. Um, yeah, that's the harshest. It's just yeah. the harshest. And uh, it's funny, you know, there's Andy Espinoza, who's a Illustration Academy person, and we were roommates and he loves ambient lighting. Like he wants to turn the lights off. Let's just use whatever's natural in the room. And I'm someone that likes to turn the light on and put it right next to their face and find some like Mike Mignola shadow shapes. So for, for people who um, maybe are new to this and uh, me, what, what I've never heard of the term sculptural lighting. What is that? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So boom, 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 boom. let's see. Is it just more like definitive lighting? Like just like you can really, yeah, because like my my face right now is uh is pretty ambient. There's not like a really graphic uh, mm -hmm. light shape. But then if I like, yeah. put a light right on me uh, okay. like that, there's yeah. gonna be much more of that. So I I tend mm -hmm. to I tend to like that. But I think one of the realities of illustration is sometimes you have to use a reference that doesn't have those dramatic shapes. Yeah, um, and yeah it's interesting because John John, you know, we talked about this. Like he was like, you know, it was kind of hard finding interesting lighting for this. And I was like, it's a movie about storms, you know, it's like overcast, everything was overcast, you know? Right. Yep. Yeah. And that's, I, I thought to myself that, and as I've, I, I tell my students a lot that whatever you're working with, it's your job to make it interesting somehow. So that's kind of the wow. journey I went through to decide on what I was going to do, um, was how can I make these pictures, how can something in these pictures be interesting to me? So this is my goal. I want to try to maybe lose some shapes and play with some stuff. So bear yeah, with it's me. Kind of, it, 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 it's, not, it's not the same, but I think like cinematography, like it's kind of interesting because when people think of like stylized cinematography, they think of like really interesting lighting. And I think you they take big swings on lighting. But then I, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, because of, the, because of this topic is interesting, like, a movie that I thought of that's very stylized, but is all flat is like children of men. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. Like, it, but, but it still manages to be very like cinematically like raved film. Right. I don't know. Just a thought out there. Uh, Scott, what are you working with tonight? I know you can't see anything now because I'm sketching really lightly, but I'm just drawn with pencil on a uh, tan kind of craft brown paper. Nice. And I'll bring in eventually some um, Copic marker warms. So these work really well with the, the tan paper and probably some white color pencil for highlights. But yeah, much like uh, Francis, it, it's pretty funny to me when I reached out to you about joining because mm -hmm. I saw Francis was going to be on and haven't hung out with Francis in a while. Last time I saw you, Francis, I think was the first uh, light box. Yes. And uh, so I was excited to hang out. And then literally after I had committed with you, Timmy, I went and looked at the reference and I was like, oh no, look at all this ambient light reference. Like I'm in trouble. This is not going to go well. So oh, I'm man, drawing... you could have just said something, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like, like Francis, I was like, you know, sometimes you just got to tackle the challenge that's ahead of you. So, yeah. um, so yeah, I'm drawing yeah. Mr. Mr. Powell here since it's the Glenn Powell summer and uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> And yeah. then if if it crashes and burns, I'm gonna move over to uh, yeah the the one of the actress in the cowboy hat instead. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I do think it's smart to lean on Glenn Powell because you get a little bit of that momentum. Yeah, like, exactly. How things yeah. turn out. <laughs> there's 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 a little goodwill built in just because it's him, you know. So uh, I was but... I was I was thinking about this the last time I saw 
um, you, Scott, in Kansas City and Francis <laughs> in Kansas City was for that first version of the the Illustration Academy at Rockhurst with, yep. in, in Kansas City. And I was thinking about it because this is really funny. We're drawing, you know, twisters. And I don't think I told, I, I probably didn't tell either. You, you guys didn't hear like the behind the scenes happening, but I've always thought that this was the funniest <laughs> thing was I would deal with talking with a lot of people planning on attending the Academy and kind of preparing them to attend and come a lot of people coming from all over the world. And uh, I was on, the, John, you'll remember this. I was on a call and a person was like, so this is in Kansas City, Kansas, right? And I was like, well, Kansas City, Missouri, but you know, it's it's basically, yeah, it's the same thing. And they were like, isn't that Tornado Alley? And I was like, technically, yes. <laughs> and they're like, if a, if a tornado were to hit, like strike down at the Illustration Academy, would I be able to get a refund? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I like thought about it for a minute and I was like, sure <laughs> like, That's part of i mean the i've never I, i've never seen a tornado in my life i'm telling them that like I'm like i've really never seen one they're like okay well you know i i guess you'll yeah you'll be dealing with my family <laughs> you should have just casually said well assuming you survive it then yeah, yeah exactly totally yeah i guess our families will be duking this out <laughs> with each other yeah, that's, the, that, that's the same individual whose mother Ask, uh, should my son bring a bathing suit? I was like, I don't know. Sure. Why not? Yeah. I, I remember being like, yep, I'm a summer counselor. That's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I don't want to be a summer counselor, that is my fate. <laughs> it does have a summer camp vibe to it. I would yeah. say. Yeah. You know, yeah. 96 was the year that the first Twister movie came out. And uh, we went to see it at the Illustration Academy with C.F. Payne. Oh, that's a blast. We got, by the way, this is Adam on the line. Yeah, Adam, on. you got to see. That's great. Hey, Adam. I recently, hey, Adam. I recently, I recently rewatched it. It holds up. It's fantastic. It does. Yeah. Bill Paxton is a, he's a, a lot of fun. So, um, wow, man, the panel is stacked tonight. Uh, the question we ask every week is like, what have you been up to this week? What is, what's been a, and it doesn't even have to be this week, but what's been like one of the big projects that you're, uh, you're currently tackling or just finished. Anybody want to go? Uh, I'm still just, uh, living in vintage train land with my latest book. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, it's got another another week to go. Well, two week and a half before the before it just needs to be done, done, the done, done, done. Adam, the cover looked really good. Oh, thank you. And congratulations on your shout out by the New York Times. Oh yeah, thanks. That was I. I found that completely by accident too. I was I was doom scrolling and I happened upon myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I, I was the one who told the public, like I posted it and the publisher was like, really? I I just actually, Cassandra, I'm glad you said that because it's pretty wild, Adam, that you got mentioned in the New York Times this week and I asked you what's been going on and it wasn't the first thing you said. And it didn't come up, right? <laughs> yeah, it didn't That's come up. That's why I thought up. I should mention it. I thought it was really Oh cool. my God. I, if I got mentioned in the New York Times like two years ago, I would have mentioned it today. <laughs> I, 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 I'm the world's worst self-employed person. Yeah. Well, it's very exciting. Congratulations. What yeah, congratulations. Know? That's awesome. Yeah. Francis. Yeah, I, I saw they had an article yeah. about children's books about the Olympics, and I actually clicked on it being like, man, no one asked me about my book about the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the cover, man. It's awesome. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you were like, yeah, you're like the terrible New York Times. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, well, man, I feel bad yeah. about myself. Yeah, Francis, what what have you uh what have you had any uh big projects that have you you've been chasing lately or wrapped up recently? Um, yeah, I think it's a huge transition part in my in my career. So broadly, um I'm on a sabbatical right now. 
So I had from May until January off, which is, which is awesome. Um, so I'm doing a big time restructuring of my, of my career and where my energies are going. Um, and I think, uh, I always enjoy, so hopefully this is, um, worthwhile to mention, but when artists talk about like the, the real life tribulations of it, of, of just the art career. So this isn't a tribulation, it's quite the opposite. So I'm looking to get married in about a year. So that's pretty exciting. So I think, um, as a result of that, I'm really thinking about the finances of this whole art career thing and, and how to restructure and organize things. Because up to this point, um, a decent chunk of my income has come from uh, teaching full time at the college. And I, I think I'm curious where private art education is going. And um, I love it. But also, I want to see like, well, what are the where, where can things go from here? So um, I'm looking at mentorship, uh, speaking engagements, getting a speaking agent. I have someone helping me with that. So I'm working on the topics there. Um, I redid my studio to organize and to sell uh, more original pieces. I'm scanning in about 350 pieces. Um, I haven't posted much over the last couple of years, but I've been pretty busy. So I have artwork to share and just to structure almost how Nicholas uh, Uribe sells his art is really inspiring. So trying to create that commerce side of things. Um, I'm signed up for a whole bunch of um, conferences and conventions. Um, and my my gal is going to be helping me a lot with that. Um, and then, you know, trying to choose the right projects. Um, so I'm, I'm doing something with the publisher now that I, I can't really talk about. I have to remember this is going on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I think just holistically, what does illustration look like in the next 10 years, which is everyone's trying to solve that. And I'm um, trying to get to a place where my family, my incoming family can be set up nicely. Um, Cause I've made a lot of decisions up to this point that are very personal and bleeding heart artists like, and I'm trying to balance that with the, um, the art side of things, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's kind of where I've been at. Um, and I've, I've, I got a um, fellowship uh, about a year ago that just wrapped up and some of the um, relationships I built from there, especially some like pretty awesome career advice has been great as far as how that relates to um, speaking and just the whole like speaking circuit in that world. So if you see me at like an IBM conference talking about why creativity is important, um, <laughs> that that uh, that is kind of the the goal. So yeah, that was that was a lot, but you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to see where things go. That's exciting! Congratulations on um, getting married soon and all those big changes. That's a that's like a lot of exciting stuff for you. Yeah, somehow I'm almost 40 years old. I can't believe that. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, almost, <laughs> you're almost 40? Oh, my God. I'm 38. You know, you're 38? Well, that's... I mean, 39 in the, you know, two You months. look like you're in your 20s still. You I'll have take the, it. You have the... I mean, you've got the hair. Of the <laughs> I love that you started with that photo. And I. the funny thing is, can I tell you the story of that dumb photo? <laughs> that when so that was for the fellowship thing and so i shot every shot with my hair up and just for goofs i was just joking trying to make the experience okay for the photographer because she was shooting these very like straightforward photos for like three hours and i'm like you wouldn't believe how silly and long my hair is she's like i'll take it out so i shot one photo so there's a roll of like 30 hair up professional shots and one shot of my hair down flowing and that's the one they put on their sites and everywhere, which is, <laughs> of course I thought that was so fun. That's a that's an episode of 30 Rock where Tina Fey is like, if you take one photo with the diaper, that's the one they use. Yes. They, <laughs> they did the diaper photo and I'm leaning into it, you know. I'll I'll take it. That's the Fabio shot. The, the last author shot someone used of me, they dug up my shot, my headshot from like 
2000, I think. And uh, my fear is that it went in Publishers Weekly for like one of their announcement things. But now I'm like going, does everyone think that I'm that weird guy who's just holding on to what he looked like 30 years ago to say like, yeah, that's still me. <laughs> You know, like like how uh, you know actors in the '80s always had their heads up in the '60s. Yeah, it's funny. You got to just keep updating those things, or all of a sudden, yeah, you turn into that guy that uh, that hasn't updated his stuff in a long time. You see that on Amazon when you click on like the or they have a scene and they show the little photo in the corner of the person. It's obviously like thirty years prior. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can't figure out, like, ev everyone who is involved in this decision, like, you know, has worked with me since 2000, <laughs> since then. Like, they, they have more recent pictures. So, so now I'm just going to have to lean into being, like, being that guy. Here's a, here's a good question for artists that, like, all running websites with their portfolio on it. Do, do you think a headshot is important to have on your website? Yeah. I think it is, but I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, I don't, from gallery side of things, the galleries love it. And some of them use that photo. I have yeah. one because I was in a show, I don't know, like five years ago where they were pairing artists in their studios with a piece that they did. And it was like the photographer's show. And then it was made into a book. So I have one yeah. photo from that and it's just what I have up. And yeah. I, I would say half my galleries have used that photo. They just yeah. like to have something to grab. Yeah, I, I agree with, and you know, publishing, well, no one will announce anything about you unless they have a photo of you. Oh, really? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's it's just, I mean, even if, even if you get a, you know, you get a book and they send you like a little publisher questionnaire if they're people you haven't worked with before. And one of the things they always, everybody just wants a headshot instantly. Like it's just it's just assumed you've got them floating around, which I think is why most there's so many like, um, like author headshots that you know for every professionally lit one, there's you know 500 pictures that look like they're just cropped in from a Thanksgiving family photo. Oh, totally. And I think it's because no one really thinks they're going to need one until the day someone says, "By the way, get me a headshot by lunch today." So then the follow-up question is, <laughs> how old do you think is too old of a headshot? <laughs> That's a great question because it's an I don't want to have to get a new one. This one was yeah. so nice. It just fell into my lap. Yeah. I I, I think a I, good headshot is a good reason to take care of yourself. I think <laughs> 17. Yeah. That's when you go like, all right. It's or like play. Yeah. watchers and let's just hang on to that moment <laughs> <laughs> i i had a meeting with somebody and it used to be i had a photo it connected to my zoom account because we started zoom, we used zoom way before it was a pandemic trend you're so, we're using it. you're so hip to me we were using it we had a zoom account when it was in 2016 and they had an office in kansas city and you i could call the guy <laughs> i had a i had a guy i had a guy at zoom <laughs> And anyway, my headshot, I didn't know how to change it. And it was a photo of me from like 2010. <laughs> and I had a meeting with a student. And when I turned on my webcam, they literally were like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, they like literally, they like acted like I catfished to them. It was so, <laughs> it was, it was so upsetting. Um, <laughs> man, Francis, I'm going to spotlight this. This is cool. Oh, thanks, man. The lighting is hard. I'm got I got little faces underneath to figure out those shapes. The nose area, I think I botched, so I'm gonna keep playing with it. I'd love to know what you, how you're using those little faces below. Like, how does that play into what you're doing? Um, I'm gonna try different shapes. I think like that is decent, but then if I iso isolate that, that's a little too much. So I'm gonna retry the light shapes here, but. I'm just trying to figure out the general design on um, how I can lose some stuff. Uh, yeah, I think I think the name of the game for me moving forward is um, how can I simplify things more? Yeah. So 
like how, like all this stuff in here um i think is is too much and i think i even like some of these shapes probably don't need to be here so like i every time i go through an iteration i'm going to try to ask like how can i lose some lose some stuff um that's really interesting uh we're going to move on to the um for those of you listening in we're moving on to the next image Please post your work to Instagram. It's hashtag Hive Alley, hashtag Drawing Hive and Ave Visual Arts Passage. Uh, post it now. Don't wait till the end. We're going to check it out. Um, it's my favorite part of the show, seeing all the art. And uh, yeah, please do it. I was really bullying the people on Discord to ask questions. <laughs> and I think this is hilarious. I was like, come on, people. This is a good night for questions. Bring on the questions. First question. A real, a real softball question. How you guys feel about AI? <laughs> just, I don't want anybody to get in hot water or anything, but because uh, it's a divisive topic, it's a. Uh, but uh, one thing I will say is, Francis, you were the first person, and I, I, I almost asked this earlier. This is six years ago, maybe seven years ago. You made a Facebook post. It was before we were make. it was when Facebook was still a platform you would make a post on. And it was about, uh, you described AI as it is today. And you said like, imagine what the industry is going to be like in like seven to eight years. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> you don't? I remember I'm reading it. I remember reading it because you were like, I think you're going to be able to type out artists and you described it to the T. I wish I could find it. But, you know, uh, Francis, when we were at Lightbox, similar thing. You you kind of predict you you had seen some kind of presentation where you were like, "Dude, this is what's coming." And I remember uh, you told me something that's very close to what AI image generators are. So yeah, you you were the one who kind of tipped me off that this this was coming. I I remember, yeah, definitely seeing some stuff that was pretty gnarly. Um, yeah. And it's I'm at the point where I just kind of assume like anything can be done, especially once 2030 hits. I, I think maybe what helped is like four years ago, um, the college I teach at CCS, they um they had a grad that was the head technology officer at Microsoft. So that person uh visited the college and um anything I said, said probably was just regurgitated from that presentation, but they predicted some wild stuff. Um, and I guess since then I've been kind of under the assumption all that was going to come true. And admittedly it has up to this point, but yeah, AI is, uh, is definitely a topic of the day. Yep. I didn't know you had that Nostradamus power, uh, Francis. Uh, he did. <laughs> he did. And I remember talking with people. I remember, I remember regurgitating what you wrote, Francis, and getting dogged on by several artists being like, you're living in a fantasy land. And I was like, well, it's not my fantasy. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, my fantasies are much weirder. <laughs> uh, but no, I remember being like describing it and then just being like, what are you talking about? This the, the, you know, I mean, it's a hard. To, it's hard to imagine. Sure, it, it sure. it's very. Um, yeah. Anyways, I was um, right before this. I was talking with um, someone that I'm working with, and they were composing a uh, a piece, and uh, we we're talking and looking at a Rockwell. How every angle, everything in the composition was basically pointing towards the focal point, and yeah. that led into a conversation that that's going to be awfully hard to automate. Uh, and, and, you know, there's obviously yeah. AI bros right now is like you watch, right. You know, but yeah. um, in general, that level of consideration throughout the process of, of the picture and picture making wise, because craft is a whole nother conversation, but picture making wise, I think is where a lot of, um, a lot of, of value can be drawn, which is I'm excited mm -hmm. for it. Because if if there's going to be a major emphasis on like composition and, and avant-garde um, image making, uh, I'm excited for that. I'm here for that. Um, yeah. Because craft is definitely getting a, a um, kick in the butt right now. Yeah. 
I like how you refer to it as picture making. It's my favorite way to explain what we do. Just, I, I don't know if I heard it first from, from, from you guys, but my life changed when I, uh, I think Brent's presentation of everything is light on dark, dark on light. And then when I realized that you can group those shapes and lose it, I was hooked. I'm like, wow, everything has the opportunity to look. And when, and like Heindel, right. How Heindel would lose everything and stuff, you know, that that's, that wasn't just like a pretty picture. That was this intellectual game that just rocked my world and still does. You know, if I could ever think and get my brain to see some things like Kindell did, uh, I'd be pretty excited about that. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I've got another um, question from the audience that I, I think it won't get you. It, it's not as dangerous as the, <laughs> the first question. Uh when you're drawing figures from reference, do you find it easier to focus on the actual body and add the clothes on after or just immediately diving in and drawing everything all together? Everything all together. Yeah. Yeah. Like shape, shape design. Yeah. Why, why try to draw the thing you don't see in order to draw the thing you can see on top of it? Yeah. It's a good question. Great question. John, everybody wants to see what you're working on. I'm keeping my camera off until I do my educational thing, Timmy. Do you want to jump into the educational thing? Yeah, that's my that's my all that's right. My, that's my new thing. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I need a rainbow that just says the more you know every time. I know. That's what that's the uh, okay, that's we're, the energy we're, we're going for. We're back to Scott, but my next slide. You know this guy, Francis? <laughs> I I am familiar. Yeah. I mean, he knew something. He knew something. He knew a lot of things. Um, he's one of the he was uh incredible. Pro probably I would you say he was the most well, he was the most famous 19th century Russian painter. Um yeah. and so many things came from him. Um uh born 1844 of uh, a realist painter um i guess today i mean he ended his life i guess it would be in ukraine today um but uh magnificent artist and uh francis anything you want to say about him you're welcome to because i know you know a lot about him so uh, he yeah, he was part of the uh i itinerants in russia which is really fascinating because uh of course in conjunction to that movement was the um what was klimt's movement called with uh vienna secession yes thank you yeah i believe there was a similar time period where artists were kind of frustrated with who was commissioning them um, and the itinerants over in Russia were led by Kromskoy, who was um, Repin's teacher. And Kromskoy was a hoot in that, you know, I think all great artists have to go into the desert and have vision quests because Kromskoy <laughs> um, did go into the desert. Um, and I believe, and anyone, if anything's wrong, please correct me, but I believe the story goes that Kromskoy worked without no reference and did a painting of Jesus in the desert um and that changed everything and he kind of had a new mantra of um how art was supposed to be made similar to how when Klimt his um brother and mom passed away at a similar time and he had a um syphilis I believe um a sexually transmitted disease and all of a sudden all of his bourgeois portraits turned into like about death and life and everything so I digress. So anyways, this big, you know, most spiritual moment happened and Kromskoy started preaching about new way of making art. Um, and so Repin was his sort of pupil at the time. Um, and I just love that story. If you want to look into the itinerants and all the stuff that they were doing, as well as the Vienna secession is really fascinating. But I think I got into Repin because um, Rockwell has always been my favorite and his level of exaggeration 
and sophisticated composition with figures always killed me. And um, repping the barge holler painting he did when he was in school. I have it in here. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that, that was his like senior thesis. And then his painting, um, it's the signing of the, I forget which document, where there's the two, like, I don't know if they're warlords, but like signing a document and everyone's laughing around them. Um, he, I think we see a lot of paintings where there's like the high craft, but there's not a lot of expression. Um, and it struck out to me like, wow, like that's something that Reppin and Rockwell did really well is they had this craft, but there was acting and it was all about um, be, going beyond just the portrait. So um, I'm a little rusty on some of my rep in history, but those are some things that really stood out to me. Um, and John referenced it earlier, but I was a very um, self-conscious art student. And uh, when I left the academy, I applied to go to what's now called the Reprint Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. And my days of wanting to go there might have passed. Um, but I was, I was accepted and I was committed to doing six years with the end goal of working in Reppin's former studio, which is only given to like the top student. Um, that's where my head was at, uh, at that time, but I'm much more comfortable these days, just hanging out in Detroit in my studio, but, um, Reppin's great. If there's anyone in the, in the, this group that hasn't done a deep dive, I do want to say there's a lot of bad reproductions of his work online. So Boy, I, I was going to mention that. And, you know, when you're looking up his work, you got to be really careful because so many people have done like master copies of his work yep. and they post them and it's very hard to discern uh, what's his and what's it, what is it. Yep. And a lot of his pieces are really browned out either from bad photos or from just aging glazes. Um so I, I have a photo or a folder of photo corrected rep and I love that piece um, imagery. So if anyone wants me to send that to them, um, shoot me an email and I'm happy to do that. He's, he's so good. If you like Rockwell, you're going to love rep. Like I, I have a, a lecture on this piece. I think this is a version. There's a different version of this piece out there. He did a couple. Um, and just, I, I like having my class ask themselves like what's each character thinking because there's another version where a male is walking in the room um and it's like oh is that the dad that left and has came back or did the dad come back from war and depending on which figure you look at and like how, what the reaction is to the person you can kind of get a different read on it um so yeah i digress anyway but yeah reppin's awesome thank you very much this is the piece you were talking about that's the study. Yeah. yeah. One of the studies. Can you can you stick on that one for a second, John? Sure. Just look at look at the storytelling there. I love it. Just the the fella looking right at the camera, just like an F you to the world. You know, he used to be that kid that's standing up, um, still has, you know, paler skin, isn't burnt to a crisp. The guy in the front almost looks like he's just like right waiting to die. Um, and the guy in the back almost, you know, that's just barely holding on. Um, I don't know. It, it just can I can you imagine doing this for a senior thesis and just the number of studies and the reference um that went into into this piece? And it's probably what half scale. I've seen I haven't seen it in person, but I've seen photos of it and it's very large. I can't imagine seeing it in person. I hope there's a way to get to Russia or somehow to see it that's reasonable for an American because that would be a killer piece to see. That's Francis, this guy, these guys up here, that that's Brent and I after the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's gosh. if that's true, that's that means I'm the guy in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that's killer amazing isn't it yeah this is not a good rep uh, this is one i wanted in there but i could I, this has a lot more color in it in the uh i saw 
um, again, I don't know which one's right, but I saw I, I in a book, I, I remember this piece was had a lot more like yellow ochre through the whole piece. But I just had to put it in there because I love that expression. The, and just the kid in the background and the yep. person in the window, those are just such powerful little details. And just the hierarchy, just a big light shape on a dark. Yep. Man. Great stuff. That angle, I can't imagine painting the angle of that that one there and keeping that vibrancy. That's killer. Yeah. I, my head would be tilted the whole time I worked on it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great piece. Landscape. His pastorals is how they described it in the little video I watched on it. I, I crack up just like thinking about this piece. Look at what's going on. I mean, it's like they're like holding these guys' appendages, and the guy's got a mallet in it. <laughs> that's a rough day. I feel like that's something that Sterling would go and sketch from life. Yeah. yeah. That one's wild. That one got him in trouble too, didn't it? Um, I think so. sure it would make sense. It got pulled from a show. Anyway, if you don't know Repin, take a good look. You can't go wrong. The reason for me showing this is just to expose new artists, people that, you know, contemporary painters, I am sure that spend a lot of time going back and looking at, at, at artists from history and um, it's important to do. Self-portrait. Handsome devil. Yep. It's just like you with a little shorter hair. No. <laughs> All right. Well, that's 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 uh, 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 Ilian Repin, and I just wanted to to uh, share that share him tonight. So, Timmy, back to it. Wow, Adam, I'm gonna spotlight this. This is looking pretty look at that. Good. That's great. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Focus on it, but. Yeah, what's fine? What I don't know what I don't know what's going on, but it yeah, yeah. it's a little too close. Oh, there we go. It's like Adam, you're drawing so blurry tonight. <laughs> wow, that's cool. <laughs> I I knew I knew you couldn't you couldn't get away from the <laughs> the Powell orbit, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So what are you Thanks. what what are you doing now? Are you just jumping to those markers or is that the right word? Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh they're pretty light values yeah. to start with and it'll it'll eventually deepen, but just uh, you know, still trying to make sure triple checking all the shapes and stuff. And as um Francis yeah. had talked about earlier, you know, I really too prefer really strong lighting strong shadow shapes you know real structural and so this is just so diffuse it's it's forcing me to try and strengthen some and kind of create and invent some shapes you know to, to have something to work with so i'm just trying to give myself enough uh enough room to make corrections before you know i get too committed but i i'm now on a what is it? it's a four value so that's starting to darken things up a little bit more yeah time to time to commit a little bit Nice. Did we finish sharing what everybody's been working on? Yeah, that, I'm actually going around the room right now. It's pretty great. 
Grants. No, no, I meant I meant your uh, question about um, oh, like pro projects or whatever. So <laughs> you'll notice, Frank, right. you'll notice, Scott, that I'm wildly inconsistent with actually falling through on everyone. <laughs> no, I'm just sitting uh, here no, with Cassandra. It's up to. I I was gonna say, well, Cassandra actually just dropped out of her internet. Just dropped out. <laughs> oh so, gosh, Bad but timing. she's she'll be back right in. But I uh, no, I basically we found out what. Uh, Adam was up to, and then I, and then I just steamrolled past everyone else. So no, uh, what else, what else is everybody cooking this week? Scott, you got anything? Um, I finished a job for Al Majala first time working for them. Um, if anybody isn't familiar with it, it's, it's an Arabic magazine that has its offices in London and, um, I learned of it because the art director, Sarah Lone, is very active on Instagram with posting the incredible work she commissions. She's really making this uh, a magazine you, you want to be part of because of the, the incredible illustration she's getting. So I was very happy to get a call from her. So I, I did a portrait that'll be out in the next issue of uh, Putin's banker. It's a lady named Elvira something. I forget her last name. And wow. probably wouldn't be able to pronounce it correctly anyways, but it was a portrait about her and how she's the one who's um, through her cleverness and whatever, you know, has kind of kept their economy afloat despite all the sanctions that have been uh, rightfully imposed given their, um, given is, the war. So is, is the magazine in Arabic? Yeah, it is. It actually cool. is in Arabic. So she, does that, that's interesting. I, I, I was wondering that because uh, right to left, right? And I, I wonder if that changes design. Like for those- Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I honestly, I didn't even, th I, I'm not aware of that. So I didn't even think of that. Um, I mean, she she gave me a very specific layout to work with and it was just basically a portrait, but um, yeah, she was great to work with and I'm excited to see how it all turns out. Uh, the, the design layout she showed me looked really good. Yeah. And then I had a really unusual job right on the heels of that um, <clears throat> for, there's an art director duo for any illustrators out there or aspiring illustrators who are watching this. Um, yeah. An art director duo you definitely want to work with is um, Robert Priest and Grace Lee. Of uh, they have a design firm called Priest and Lee, and they're just wonderful people. I, I've they're one of the few art directors where I've actually gotten to meet them in real life, and um, they're just lovely people and give a lot of great creative freedom. And so they called me up for the goofiest job, not the goofiest job I've ever done, but it, it's it's in the running. Um, it was a feature as best as I could surmise. I think it's a feature in for it's for Forbes magazine coming out in the next issue. And I think it's a feature on the founder of Jersey Mike's. I think that's like the main article. <laughs> yeah. And then this is like a little sidebar of, um, it was like six classic sandwiches. So that's all they wanted. They just wanted me to illustrate sandwiches. And I, I'm friends with uh, a number of Southern California illustrators that we, we get together for lunch every now and then. And um, one of them, I was I mentioned this job and he said, you know, back in the fifties and sixties, like that was, illustrating food was a big part of how a lot of illustrators, you know, put yeah. food on the table, you know, like that, that was kind of a tradition. So uh, I felt like I, I kind of got to fulfill like a, you know, a genre of illustration, very old school that I never would have expected and ended up being a lot of fun. Yeah. On, on the topic of like editorial illustration, my, my new favorite magazine is called the surfers journal. Mm -hmm. And anyone interested in editorial illustration, you should check it out because mm -hmm. it is, it, it's actually really interesting because my, I, my brother got it for me for my birthday, he got me a subscription and, uh, it's really interesting because I, I, my brother's pretty involved in printing and, it, you know, follows these things pretty closely. He was like, there's kind of a Renaissance happening with like, like, um quarterly journals mm. um that are like really really well done and thoughtfully produced and uh and like have beautiful artwork in them and surfers journal is one that got um uh what would you call it like brought back to life and then there's a major climbing magazine that got brought brought back as well and the surfers journal is like it is 
I have never seen a magazine with more illustration in it than the Surfer's Journal. It is loaded with it. I don't know how they afford it. <laughs> it's stunning. It's just like almost every other page is like I will it's sure almost to check a it out. There's like no there's almost and it's a it's a magazine for people who like surfing, right? So there's almost more illustration than there is photography in it, which is not what you would expect for like a sports journal. Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. It's really great. In Detroit, I was really excited. They opened up a, uh, like a record store that also a big part of the branding is they sell print and that's like the whole thing. Um, really? where, you know, they have very niche obscure and, and and mainstream too, but like that's mm -hmm. a big part of their branding, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, that's reaching out to a demographic that wants the tactile, that wants to feel it, that wants to um, not just scroll through the content, but flip through it. And they have like reading sections. So it's like, hey, do you want to go to the club on a Friday night or go listen to yeah. some house music and flip through magazines? And that's, that's just yeah. cool. And I think that's a sign of the time too, that you know, yeah. people want, want that. We don't want to lose it, you know? Yeah, I mean... Uh, we made a, I mean, I mean, we didn't, I made a story for visual arts passage about it because I was like blown away. Tony gets me this, my brother gets me this journal and I open it and there's like a 15 page, like in-depth article about like Ralph Steadman and his relationship with, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gonzo journalist, Hunter, uh, no, Hunter, Hunter, Hunter S. Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. yeah. Hunter S. Thompson. And, uh, and I was just like, oh, this is wild. This is like things that you feel like are kind of getting forgotten, you know? You don't, I don't know. Not in, in your world, but like for a surfer journal to be like, this is a story we want to tell. You're like, that's why, I don't know. That's, yeah, I would not expect to find a that's a hard story. <laughs> that is a hard pitch. Yeah. Um, because I know a lot of surfers, none of them know that story. <laughs> And I don't know that I would think I wouldn't immediately be like, this is a story they need to know, but it was a, it was a blast. It was really well done. And the artworks, you know, amazing. And I don't know, but yeah, I, I think there's a bit of a Renaissance Francis. Like that's pretty cool. I mean, seeing that, I think it is following it's similar path is like vinyl. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. We, this, the tactile, like right now, yeah. uh, there's third man records and Jack White's, new album yeah. released on record is um is being released so people are lining up and um i, pr I appreciate that you know like double yeah. on just the physical yeah hey, i'm gonna step out one second y'all i'll yeah. be right back yeah jack white's always been kind of a the the leader of tactile you know he was a furniture he designed furniture Really? I didn't know. Yeah, he made furniture. I mean, like, he didn't, like, he, like, built furniture in, like, before the White Stripes at, like, this furniture store in Detroit. And the furniture that he built is pretty valuable now. I don't know. It's probably not very good. <laughs> it's probably, I don't know. You can't sit on it. <laughs> yeah, he's done. but I don't know. He's a pretty technically, I mean, like talk about technical skill, uh, Detroit tone, Jack White. Like, did you ever see, is it coffee and cigarettes that like, it's kind of a documentary. It's like Wu-Tang Clan. The one guy that's definitely seen it just walked out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. I yeah. haven't seen it, but. I but saw like, it might get loud, which had Jack White in it, which was awesome. It's a documentary. Okay, was about it might get was it might get loud guitars. or was it okay? You can tell me if this was in might get loud. Does Jack White build a guitar out of Yeah, that's the that's the opening scene of it might get loud. Yeah. He built okay. like he builds it on like a porch. It's it's yeah. wild. Yeah. He just builds this crazy guitar and then quickly like does a riff on it and is like yeah. he, he says something really uh kind of you know cocky at the end of it of like you know like put that in your pipe and smoke it or something you know i just remember yeah. there was a pretty like baller move of like check out what i just did it's pretty yeah. sweet yeah no i was mix i was mixing that up with coffee and cigarettes which is more forgettable than that that's pretty awesome 
I always just think of like Bill Murray talking with Wu Tang Clan and mm-hmm. coffee and cigarettes. You're just like, oh, this is great. Do you all have an artist that, because we always talk about like artists in in your realm that have inspired you or like led you down the path that you've gone down, but do you have an artist from like a totally different school or genre or maybe not even visual arts that you feel like has influenced what you do? Like substantially? I know mean, it's kind of a, this might be a kind of a tough question, but. I, I've i listened to not any one particular, um, well, just a couple. Um, Billy Joel, um, Elvis Costello, and Bruce Springsteen talk about write, songwriting, music writing. Mm-hmm. And you could literally... It's more so that with Bruce Springsteen than any of them, you could replace picture making with songwriting. Um, when oh, they're talking really? about like abstract design theory and how how composition and design works, and it, that I always thought was really really interesting. Yeah, I remember hearing an interview with Bruce Springsteen around the time his memoirs came out, and I remember thinking the same thing. Like it was. As, as a visual artist, it was really, really relatable. In fact, almost more than it was as a, as a musician. Well, you're, you're both, so you would know more about it than me, but just, I just thought it was just a really good explanation. And, he, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't technical. It was, right. it was, it was very uh, simplified. And it was just a fantastic explanation of what you think about when you're designing. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone, we're going to move on to our longest pose of the evening. It's uh, hashtag hive. Please post your work to Instagram. It's hashtag high valley, hashtag drawing hive, and at visual arts passage. Um, please share it. We're going to check it out at the end of the night. All right. Cassandra, what what piece is you working on for a show right now? Um, I just finished up a piece for a show called Spectrum Five at Arch Enemy. And um it like we had to pick a color and paint something from it. So I picked orange and then realized orange is really hard. We have to paint 70% <laughs> of the painting with orange being the main component. Um, so I'm very pleased that I finished that one. So I get to put that in the, ma- uh, the mail. And then um, it's not till next year, but I'm gonna kind of fit them in in between, but I'm doing um, like a, it's called the mini museum at Robert Lang and they have this funny nook and they just hang a bunch of little paintings in it. And it's like, it's, it's a mini solo. So um, I did a three inch painting on Tuesday of a, of a little dignified mouse for that one. Cool. It's just getting a bunch of that kind of stuff done. Where, where is this gallery, Cassandra? Um, the one with the mini museum. Uh-huh. That's Robert Lang Studios in Charleston. Okay. Yeah, so they're really fun. They're, they're great to work with. And then um, I always do like a new Christmas card to sell in a gift shop and on my website and all of that stuff. So I designed that out and I'm going to paint that, I think, next week. So just get into all of these things before I get really buried under all the shows coming up. Three inches is very small. That must have been fun. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was hard going from a big painting to three inches. And I thought like, oh, th- I'm, this is going to get done so quick. It's going to be great. And um, it was brutal. I didn't finish it because I just kept um, kept painting over. So, yeah, I'm hoping to come back a bit fresh on that one. Which which was the orange one for? That was for Arch Enemy Arts in Philadelphia. 
So I did, um, there's the goddess P Panoma, and it's like the goddess of the Roman goddess of fruit. So I did a red fox as the Pomona goddess. Because I think of lots of harvest tones with orange. So that was fun. I wonder how many portraits of Trump they got. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, no, um, like, so all the artists, like, you submit what color is your top choice. And so they're hoping oh, okay. to hang a rainbow. So I don't know wow. if there's any other oranges besides me. <laughs> that would be a pretty wild rainbow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have I have a question for Francis, but I've got a question for the group that they can you can all uh, let this soak in and think about it while Francis answers. Um, somebody asked for I want some art book recs. So uh, everybody start thinking about art book recs right now. Francis, I had a question for you about you went on this pretty grand like expedition to Alaska. Was that two years ago? Yes. Yep. It was over the top. It was really, it was truly, I feel like we live in a time where it's, it's pretty difficult as a person to go on like a true adventure. You know, it's yeah. not like, that's not like a good cookie cutter experience. Like you really have to be, you go out of your way to find that, like where the adventure still is. And obviously Alaska is a place that has no shortage of it. Um, but you, you made it this like career opportunity. Like I, one of the questions I have to ask is like, how do you make stuff like that happen for yourself? Well, try to copy Sterling Hunley. And, uh, <laughs> first of yeah. all, can you tell me a little, can you give me like the basic of exactly what happened? Cause like, I know you went on this big adventure and you were there just as an artist, Yeah, but I, I don't know the, the gritty details of it, but then how you made it happen. Sure. Sure. That's actually, yeah. um, something I could talk about a lot. So I'll do the quick version, but, um, Funny thing is, I'm actually still finishing um, a book about that time. Um, that's what I pitched for my uh, sabbatical was to finish that book, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't dissimilar to what George Pratt did for his Morocco adventure. So I was just really inspired by um, Sterling had legend deer and would go out and have adventures and George followed through and he always wanted to go to Morocco and he did that. Um and, you know, those are people that have been very influential for me. And I think especially like Sterling um, has an athletic background and I love athletics. So um, I, I think it was in Austin about 12 years ago when I was living in Austin, Texas. Um, and um, my buddy, Andy Espinoza, was starting to look into residencies and he sent this one he's like man i don't want to go to alaska but you you i know you, this might be something you're into so long story short they had a residency program um called voices of the wilderness where um you know you basically you go in the wilderness with a, a ranger that has a rifle for the bears and i'm like wow i've been sitting in my chair i was working on a comic project at the time and i've been sitting in a chair um pretty isolated not moving a lot for a while um, I was thinking about some adventures, you know, that Sterling had talked about and other artists and like Frederick Remington going out West and this and that. So I'm like, this could be a fun opportunity. Um, I was also, I was raised in the city. I'm in Detroit now. I've always been a pretty city guy. So I'm like, this will make me pretty uncomfortable, which was appealing in and of itself. So I did one in Sitka, Alaska, and it was great. It, it completely changed me, made me appreciative for everything that I've, um, that I have and take for granted, like running water and having a bathroom and <laughs> all that stuff. So anyways, um, I felt that again, uh, about two and a half years ago, I'm like, man, I've just been really solo. I was coming out of COVID like a lot of folks. And I'm like, this is about time for another adventure. So when I signed the form on which wilderness I wanted to go to, they had one that said you had to have a high level of fitness because of just the amount of walking and traversing precarious landscapes i'm like cool that could be a challenge um and it was the most desolate and i'm like wow okay i did it once let's really go for it and and they picked me and 
Um, it was my job, not so much. They didn't care as much about the art that I made. They cared about, could I bring Alaska back to my community? Because um, they receive a lot of people like coming from Montana and Wyoming and Maine um, that do adventuring things. People that just kind of have adventures in their background. Um, that's just, you know, the type of person they are, but they have a hard time bringing people more from the city into Alaska. So they're like, we don't really care about the art you do that much. Um, but you know, we know you have a connection because I teach and whatever in the community I have here. So could you bring that back to Detroit? And like, sure. So, um, the experience was I, I was hanging out with, um, about 12 biologists or so, and they were running, walking transects a mile at a time up and down the Northern Arctic coast, studying birds and small animals. And, um, I documented it in my sketchbook, very journalistic style looking. I even pitched Robert Weaver's like baseball drawings. Um, they're like, sure, that looks cool. Um, in a sketchbook. And uh, I've done about six talks around Detroit um, about that experience. And I'm, I'm going to, they, they're selling a version of the, the book already in their stores. And I'm going to make a version that I am the publishing rights to that I'll just sell at the conventions that I had mentioned earlier. But the thing I'm particularly most excited about is I'm working with the city of Detroit to sponsor um, some Detroit young people to go to Alaska and to experience the things that I experienced. Because um, I mean, I remember growing up here, sometimes you just don't leave a couple square miles and, and there's a big world out there. And that was profound for me to leave to leave to Florida or to Alaska, et cetera. So anyways, um, that's the goal is just to get some some kids up there and I'll art direct them as they um, create the art. So combining art and adventure um, is the goal. So that's the semi long, short version of everything, but it was awesome. And if anyone is interested in um, combining adventure, there's a lot of residencies out there across the world that can really accommodate that. So feel free to hit me up. I'm happy to talk your ear off about it. National parks have great artists in residency like that. Absolutely. I did one in Alaska too. It was, I loved it out there. Oh, where in, where in Alaska? I did the uh, Chukuk Trail. So it was two weeks backpacking on the trail and just painting from there and just holding workshops and stuff. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah residencies are the best. They tend to be seen as a kind of like a fine art thing, but um, illustrators can absolutely uh, apply to them. In many re uh, respects, I think illustrators could even thrive better because it's all about like, what can you carry with you and doing art quick under interesting circumstances. So I think it's perfect for illustrators. Agreed, for sure. That's so special. How long was it for? Um, so it was going to be out in the field for 10 days, but because of the wildfires, it was only, I think, like six days, um, which was an eye opener because, I mean, it was global warming. I mean, there's wildfires and fires are natural, but to the extent that they were, um, was global warming influenced so we was had that another level kind of than what they normally have yes yeah they were pretty intense when so i got there at like 12 uh midnight and it was 24 hour sunlight but it was so smoky the sky was red so i felt like i was landing in some sort of like mars landscape it was oh my like... gosh um so you know i i actually i spent those days just waiting for a helicopter um, clearance because the smoke was so heavy. So I just kind of walked around and sketched around Fairbanks, which was awesome. And I have a lot of stories from that kind of made it in the book too. Um, so Alaska is great. People are amazing in Alaska. They're, they're survivors and the things that would make a lot of, um, or some people uncomfortable um, is just part of the daily life, which is cool. I have a friend that lives up in Delta Junction and that's where the road ends in Alaska. Like you drive on the main highway and it ends in, in her town. And, you know, she would describe situations in the winter like, yeah, like we had to shovel the roof so it didn't collapse because we had so much snow, like just problems I've never experienced, <laughs> just like everyday life for them. 
Yeah, it seemed like the way that we get around with cars, I was just struck like everyone had some type of plane or knew someone with a plane. Like just the amount of people that would just get around because things are so desolate. I'm like, wow, that's just kind of daily life, you know? Yeah, right? and there's like a law. You're not allowed to lock the your car, especially in the winter, if like you were stuck out in the cold and need a place to like take shelter, all cars need to be unlocked. <laughs> really yeah yeah That's wild i, was I would definitely be a law looks like i'd be a lawbreaker <laughs> <laughs> in dead horse which is also like near the end of the highway um i asked i'm like why in all the parking lots are there's these rows of like extension cords dangling oh yeah and um it was because it gets so cold that the car could lock up like so absolutely freezing that it always has to be like connected to just a little bit of heat and you know it, and and in that town i remember i was struck it was just un assumed that it was like 94 percent male you know I, i'm like wow. wow this is interesting um you know just the dynamics there you, you know so free yeah, that's a, all these that's dudes a, and, that's a generous description <laughs> 94 percent men down of 94 percent men yeah it was uh interesting was that's something. a description of like me going to a frat house it was uh interesting <laughs> uh, i i i edited a video for the wade bros uh years ago it was for um uh, what's the sunglass major sunglass Oakley. Um, and it, they, they went out to, uh, they were going to have me shoot it originally. And then a guy, um, a really talented cinematographer um, hopped in um, and uh, they shot it in Barrow, Alaska. Have you ever heard of that town? Mm -mm. It's no. the furthest, it's the furthest North town in the Americas. Wow. Um they had to fly out, you know, it took them like five days to get there. It was ab absurd. Um, and they, when they were there, they filmed a surfer who goes surfing in the Arctic circle. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen that one that it's wild. Yeah. And I had to edit it and it looks like they're on an alien planet. <laughs> it's wild. I didn't know you edited that. That was so cool. Yeah. Um, but, uh, really really tough town and at the time so this is like 2015 i think and at the time we were all it was a we call it like the golden era of <laughs> the wade brothers we were all enjoying ourselves a lot there was like a lot of partying and Lyndon Lyndon was a real he loved a party and they got all the way to barrel alaska and they found out it was a dry county <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a nightmare uh so i was glad i wasn't there because it would have been, I would have handled it well today, but I think the 25 year old version of me would have really um, been uh, upset. <laughs> I would have been like, oh, me and my bros, we're going to Alaska. We're going to party. We're going to have fun. And then you get to this. I mean, it's like pretty, like, it's like a true, it's a town set up for a true detective. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's un unbelievable. Like when you, you, you guys describing those parts of the, the country and and having the chance to be there so few people get to see that or like it's so uh isolated it's it's, so it's unbelievable beautiful i will say though the mosquitoes are insane yeah. i've heard they're yeah. like dinosaurs there and they really are yeah could you handle the isolation though like could you, like let's say let's say magically you can you can support your career and and it can it can work, but you're gonna be working in in a town like that, like a isolated a town you gotta take like a weird mode of transportation to get to. Like a it's like a, oh, you gotta get on the snowmobile or the, or like the the whatever, the water plane. <laughs> do you think you can handle the isolation? Is that like kind of an illustrator's dream or does that sound nightmarish? Like I I, I love going to isolated places. I went to this island also called Grimsey in Iceland that's in the Arctic Circle and only 70 people live there and they've been living there since like Viking age. 
And so I got to like stay with, um, with the family there and they really showed me what it's like to be in those isolated places. The mm. whole island is their family. And they yeah. were showing me pictures through the decades of like what they do on holidays. So to me, actually, it felt very comfortable because mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to really just know your neighbors and lean on your neighbors in a way that we kind of have lost, I think, more in the more yeah. like populated areas to the level that they are. I, I love a small town that, you know, it's, it's a type of town that doesn't really exist in a lot of places anymore, but like, I think of it like the Stephen King town, like the, it's a small town. They've got a small movie theater. They've got all of the cool things, but everybody still knows each other. Mm -hmm. So I think magical. if you like your yeah. neighbors, it's probably wonderful. If you yeah. don't like your neighbors, it's probably horrible. I, I that's like a meme that it's like it's like every town it's like the, the meme that I'm thinking of is it basically Scott it shows like a photo of Santa Barbara and it says like like a the landscape of Santa Barbara and it says like every band in the 90s was like we got to get out of this town <laughs> <laughs> and you're like what the hell are you guys talking about it's a great town <laughs> that's funny yeah. like the, the, yeah like escapism rock like we got to get out of this dumb town. <laughs> you're like, you're, li you're living in the dream right now. Well, then they all go back later. Cause they're like, yeah. uh, so it turns out it's really cool here. Yeah. Anthony Kiedis was like, I guess I'll spend $5 million on my California home. Uh, here's a, here's a question related to the residency. Um, what do you need? Like what, what goes into participating in a residency? Like, does anyone do it? Um, especially like if you're new to this, the world of art, like you're like, let's say you're just, you're just starting to cut your teeth in illustration. Like, is that cart before the horse? Uh, there's databases for this kind of stuff. Like um, the, the website's like call for entry.com. I think it's called for entry. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's called call for entry. And there's a couple others where, you know, people apply to say, you apply to group shows or solo exhibitions or for public artworks. And one of the things they advertise are um, for residencies and fellowships. And uh, so, the, and, and that, that's just one example, but there are these and they, you know, they've all got different sort of portfolio requirements. Some, some you have mm -hmm. to sort of give a statement of sort of what your proposal is to do um, on, on the residency. Um, some are more focused than others. Some you just go to make, art whatever that art is some they put you up for you know say a couple weeks and with a little grocery stipend and at the end you just have to give them one piece of art that you made from it um but but there's 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 online databases for tracking them down and finding out what the, the requirements and parameters uh are some are more open to emerging artists and some are more open to like mid-career like they're all very okay. different you know like zion and and grand canyon are extremely competitive so those those really go to like some top tier artists um but like when you find the more off the map parks like that's where there is more opportunity because maybe they, it didn't get the word didn't get out as much but honestly i think those are actually more exciting because they're so excited you're there mm -hmm. um like when i got out to um Klondike Gold Rush National Park, they were so excited that I was there, both for the American side and the Canadian side. And they gave me so many cool opportunities and just really appreciated mm -hmm. that I was excited to be there. So I think it's very dependent upon what place you're looking at because there's a whole gradient of it. Yeah. When I was in, uh, me and Jeremy Collins did that movie and uh, we ended up going to the Banff Film Festival mm -hmm. in Banff, Canada. And there, there's a ton of residencies available in Banff. Um, I heard that's, but, uh, a, that's a really good one too. They were telling me about it there. Yeah. Well, it's funny because we got to stay. Well, it's funny because <laughs> Jeremy did some bartering and I learned that his lodging was very different than my lodging, which we got there and he got like residency lodging. So he was in this like cool, like hut in the middle of the woods that was like had one entire wall completely glass, you know, so you could like look off into the forest. And mine was like a cement 
uh, cube that like could be fully hosed out when I left. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> and, and, and to walk to it, they, they, the whole time I was there, they, they would say, you really should not walk back to your room at night because, um, there's a bear that's been killing things. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I didn't know until like the end of the trip, like, I was like, damn, Jeremy, this is pretty nice. Like <laughs> I, you couldn't have bartered two of these, <laughs> but no, uh, there was a, there's a, it's really cool in Banff, Canada. There's this, um, old wooden ship that they've there's i believe there's more than one of them but um it, it i i saw one and it's in the woods it's this old wooden ship in the middle of the woods and you can walk into it and it's this giant it's beautiful and it's been built into this like you know a tiny home basically and uh it's where uh the book life of pi was written oh like, wow during, during a residency yeah yeah that's um, some bragging rights well, I mean, not, I, I didn't stay in it. I just but I mean, saw just it. I just like, walked, hey, walked you can past this cabin. Life of Pi was written here. I mean, I just don't know many other places, you know? Oh, yeah. Like when you talk about a residency, like what are the like tangible yeah. outcomes that like, you know, really blossomed into like. A, yeah, I mean, like that, no that's pressure, a, but Life of Pi was written here. Like that. Yeah. That's, that's you know. Oh, and talk about some daunting, some daunting weight to like be the next person to go into the Life of Pi boat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be like, can I get a different vote, please? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I told you all that I'm going to try to go the simple route. And I, I, I lied. <laughs> I was going to say, if that was simple. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. So I'm trying these are some wacky shapes i uh i i like i did the simple route and i like i did it and i'm like well that's kind of cool here let me start I, I don't know like i didn't have the i wasn't as satisfied so then i like started doodling some of these funky shapes that were obviously way more detailed like i tried to simplify here and i'm like just i enjoy doing this more so this felt a little mechanical so yeah. yeah, now we're going a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more uh, detailed than I had said I would. So, yeah, I suppose that's how it goes sometimes. But it's looking cool. Thanks. Here's another question um, related to residencies, which is, um, do you see value in residencies that the artist pays for uh, versus these opportunities that are fully funded? My my gut reaction is going to be, it's always going to be case by case, right? Yeah. But, yeah, totally. I mean, uh, you can make up anything. Just be like, yeah, I'm going to the forest and this is my own residency. Like you can just add the name if you're going to do art somewhere and it becomes a residency. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like it can be really great or it can be really bad. I think just research it. And if there's an artist that you've seen that's gone there, like reach out and see if they appreciated yeah. the opportunity or liked it. But I think it's completely like you were just saying to me, just dependent upon the person and the experience. Oh yeah. And like, how bad do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. Cause if you really, really want to do it and it's not like, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the price they're asking for, but like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm speaking out of school here, but because I've, I've never participated in a residency, but I don't know in my life, oftentimes the things I really want to do, I've had to pay for. I mean, I don't, yeah, like I got a stipend for mine um, that was pretty good, but it still didn't cover all the expenses. Um, so I still had to pay for some yeah. of it. And gosh, it was worth its weight in gold. It was an amazing experience. Yeah, I'm also not saying that you're not entitled to get paid or like that you don't deserve to get paid, but it's just like, if you want to do something, like sometimes I think the worst thing you can do is just like, it, it, there's no shortage of excuses not to do things. Like mm -hmm. you'll never run out. It, it There's a good reason not to do everything. So I don't know. Yeah. Have, have you guys find yourselves at crossroads like that before during your career? Like almost every job I'm offered. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to go, all right. Uh, if I said no to this, would I be sitting around drawing anyway without anyone paying me? Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I This isn't the same. I, 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 that sounded, yeah. cynical. I didn't mean it to sound cynical. Like it really is like something that I think about all the time. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, I guess my best example of it is a, a person that I really admire that is a really talented director just hit me up like a couple weeks ago and was like, Hey, I've got something. Um, it's not, it's not right for you. It's not an opportunity, but if you want to do it, it would be helpful to me. And I was like, what, what's the deal? And they're like, well, you edit my friend's like birthday video for his like five-year-old kid. And I was like, I was like, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and it's just cause it, I'm just like trying to be like, I don't know, like, I first of all I'm Italian so I love it when somebody owes me a favor and <laughs> it's built into my DNA <laughs> and and I don't know I it's a bad deal I agreed to a bad it was a bad deal but it's okay you know I accepted it was a bad deal when I started it right right you knew what you're getting into yeah and so I'm assuming that you guys have to play that scale every now and then you have to get the scale out and be like, is this mm-hmm. fair to, is this fair to Cassandra or is this fair to Francis? And I don't know yeah. about you guys, but I get asked to do charity auctions like a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, it's always tough because like, if it's, if it's a, like a really good cause, I want to do it, but it's kind of stinky for artists. If you all don't know this already, artists cannot write off anything but the supplies for the artwork. The people who buy the artwork um, can write the whole thing off, but the artists themselves that make the artwork that is auctioned off can only write off the supplies. So it always feels just a bit unfair on that. Like, you know, you should be doing, it's it's for a good cause and so you get to feel good about it. But I always just kind of get mad that the artists can't write off the thing that they did. They put all the work into yeah. it. So I'm always battling like, okay, do I really believe in this cause? Is it worth it in that? Or is it not? Like, if I'm going to be mad about it, I don't want to do it because that's not fair to the person who's asking from a genuine place. But um, like, if I'm, if I'm going to feel icky about it, I don't want to do it. Oh, that's the kind of thing I always think about. What's like, does anybody have a project that just felt like it never ended? Like what? I mean that I, I don't want to get anybody in trouble because I guess I guess I can get you in trouble with that one. I but, bet we all have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely I've had that. Yeah. Well, how long did it go? And we don't you don't have to tell me about it, but how long did it actually go? And how long did it feel it went? <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking of one word, just the amount of revisions went far beyond what was yeah. reasonable, you know, like, and just, is this like, is this like stuff. six months? Is this like, are we talking like six months? Or are we talking like shorter than that? No, actually it's funny. The one I'm thinking of, it was just an editorial job, but it was like one of those tight deadlines where all of a sudden they're revealing to me of, uh, you know, what a total yeah. lie the deadline was because then all of a sudden there was all the time in the world for these nitpicky revisions and yeah the it finally stopped when they asked me to completely redo a hand of one character and i just pointed out to, it, it was not from the art director it was from the editor and yeah. i just said can you just try saying no to her you know and just like yeah. like that's a lot of extra work that i'm not getting paid <laughs> for and it's not going to change the meaning of it <laughs> and once I kind of did that, then the art yeah. director came back to me kind of laughing and said, uh, she immediately backed down was like, oh, okay. It was just like, it was clear it was an editor where the yeah. editor kind of thought it's no big deal, right? Like the artist can make these changes in five minutes, you know? So they, they were just asking for little tweaks that occurred to them. And once we yeah. finally resisted, that finally ended it, you know, but in which made me wish we'd done that a lot sooner. Oh, it's just communication, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And setting healthy boundaries for yourself where you're like, I'm done. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, have exactly. You, like, I love, I love that. Have you tried saying no? <laughs> Early on, I had a six month project that after a year was still getting sketch revisions. And uh, so I, I, I stood up for myself and uh, they, they fired me and blacklisted me. Oh, oh mm, I, I wow. stood up. I wasn't rude. I actually just asked for more money. Um, I was like, oh, this is a six-month project, and I'm still working on my sketch advance a year later, and the revisions are starting to re- look like the things that got rejected 12 months ago. Like, so I something has to, you know, if I'm going to keep drawing, 
I think that the advance needs to change. And uh, so they, they took 24 hours and told me that it was time to end our professional relationship and uh, found it years later uh, that, that I had been blacklisted and that designers weren't allowed to mention my name around there. What? Like 20, wow. years, later, 20 years later, oh, they, apparently I was still not persona non grata. I thought we were the only. I thought we were the only people doing that, Adam. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, the, know. The funny thing about that, Adam, is it's like, yeah, you wanted to work for them again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I mean, it's always you never know. You know, it's like uh, you don't want to like. Uh, I don't know. It's not. You never want to burn any bridge. It's like. No, I, I it's always been my I, attitude. I, yeah. I thought I'd been pretty flexible. I mean, I had been pretty flexible. Yeah. You know, it was a 30 page, 32 page book that I'd redrawn three times. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, it's tough to be honest and not be emotional when you're being honest with someone. And the second you become emotional when you're being honest with somebody, it's like yeah, everything goes out the window. Like it, it makes coming to a meet like a middle ground really hard, I think. Yeah, and you know the other thing you have to watch out for, and you know, in, yeah, is uh, getting advice from any of your other like friends or relatives who think they understand how business works. Yeah, <laughs> they're not telling you. They'll they'll give you advice that you go. You, they don't realize how small your world is. No one does. Oh, and so, I I would argue everyone's world is smaller than they think it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dead on. Yeah, everybody's always like, you need to stand up for yourself. You need to da da da. <laughs> like, we're negotiating. I, I yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, one thing I've learned is the most successful business people that I've ever met, like like absurdly successful. There were people that thought that they were their best friends, and the successful person couldn't stand them. <laughs> yeah, it's like the art of war. It's just you know. It's the best revenge. Um, but I, I don't know. That's 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 always tricky. Na navigating that world of like negotiating edits and whatnot. I get that constantly with video where people completely we, in video it's always pipeline. People don't understand um certain things happen to have have to happen at certain stages. And uh you know, once you're doing like color and audio, it's like, please don't, please don't send me like a foundational note, <laughs> you know. Please don't make me replace Kevin Spacey right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll fix it in post. Um, Adam, that's awesome. Yeah, you're cooking, man. You're I think I'm more. procrastinating on starting a third drawing, so I'm just trying to think more things to stick in the sky. <laughs> I do like the witch on the wheel or the bike. <laughs> Wait, that's right. There's a little basket on the front, isn't there? How dare you not have the basket, Adam? Oh, you got the cow. That's all I was worried about. <laughs> that's where I started. <laughs> got the cow and the plaid, so my day is... No, it's a, I've been working on this book where the main character is is a train, like a realistic train. It's not like Thomas the Train. So long. So like I was looking for it tonight because I was like, humans, I'm going to draw humans again. It's gonna be great. <laughs> well, and I'm also in the painting state. So it's like it's it's weird when you're in, in, in these long projects where it's like there are months where I was just drawing and going, man, I need to make sure that I'm in shape for when I start paintings again. And then I've been working on paintings for two books back to back and like kind of going, all right, do I remember how to draw though? <laughs> That's kind of what I feel like tonight. I haven't used pastels in a long time. What yeah. have you been using, John? I've been like different, trying down some mixed media stuff and done some straight up oil paints and uh, oil crayons, all kinds of stuff. Uh, just playing around. I've been using. I, 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 I think Cassandra thinks this way too. This is like. This is like a gym for us. Yeah. Just come in here and play. 
we do it so much and I like that. What's your flat file looking like? You, you have to have at least 500 drawings or so? You know, the ones that are hanging up here, there's 10 behind each one of them. And I just, you know, I put, I, I do something I like, I put it up there. And then I got a whole bunch of paintings that I haven't, they're just stacked behind me. Uh, but Cassandra, we've probably done well over a thousand. Oh gosh, I have so much like cardboard lying around with random people on it. <laughs> I mean, it's episode, this is episode 213. And, but, but y'all, John, you, you're doing how many, how many do you think you average per episode? Well, sometimes I just do, I mean, most of the times recently, I've just been doing one, but yeah. the, for the, probably the first year or two, you for did the first like year I did four. three and then we were doing it twice yeah. a week for two years with studio bridge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't yeah. talk about Studio Ridge anymore. Yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. That kind of hurt. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah, no, the first year of of like drawing yeah. high of illustration isolation back then, I was doing all three and I was always pushing yeah. to all three. And now I'm like, I'll do one or two and slow down. Here's you know, a, what, here's what a question. You're like, John's yeah. not doing, he's just doing one. Yeah, John's doing one. I'm just doing one. <laughs> no, but here's a question for the panel and for those tuning in, because I always tell everybody tuning in, try to draw all of them. Um, it's a do as John says, not as John does. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but oh, would, would you say that for most people tuning in, they should try to do at least three or what, like, how do you feel about that? Well, um, it depends what they're, trying to work on you know it's yeah. like um if you're trying to you know just really work on your drawing skill i i would i would try to at least part of the time try to do a bunch of fast faster ones and fast starts and then i i think you learn i think you get better and learn quicker by doing more of that than doing a lot of rendering mm -hmm. but then um every once in a while dig in and render one you know because you can learn something from that too um, yeah george would have us do the uh, when i was in school would have us do the um movie drawings film drawings and we would have i forget how long it was like 10 minutes to do a whole scene um and that was all about just simplifying shapes and getting your picture to read which i think is would be super valuable it's a good way like a good warm-up like when I came in here today, I'm like, I just want to work on shape design because those shadow shapes are stressing me out. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's hard, it's hard. It's really hard to draw because I I, I have a I thought it'd be easier, Francis. I did a, a black and white printout of it and just pay attention. But it's so different than the I mean, the value changed so much when I'm looking at the color piece on my computer. Yeah. Um. So it's, it's making it do what I want to do. I have to keep looking at both. So yeah. I have a quite I have a question for everybody. Uh, there have been times in my life where like somebody gave me some wisdom or gave me like had to come to Jesus talk with me and gave me some advice. And I think, wow, if I had not had that chat, I'd be like years behind where I'm at now. Like it's safe, like that conversation, like that 15 minute, bit of wisdom saved me like three years in like just bumbling right what what do you think is is some wisdom that you got that just saved you the most amount of time in in, in getting to where you want to be or doing what you want to do about every critique i got at the illustration academy yeah really <laughs> really <laughs> was it that quick for you you felt that like it was just like whoa uh... You know, actually, I will. I I can remember. Um, so I went three summers. Um, so for any listeners or viewers yeah, for anybody knowing, know, we're just talking real, about. yeah, I'll just say real quick. The Illustration Academy. Yes. It's kind of what we've distilled into what we're doing online now, Visual Arts Passage. But John John founded the Illustration Academy, and it was like our in person uh, workshop. It's John, you hosted yeah. it around. Yeah, John, you hosted it around the country all the major art schools. Sorry, Scott. I mean, uh, 
No, right. that's that's yeah, yeah. That, that's the perfect summary. So you know, it was in person art training over the summer, and uh, I can remember in particular there was one summer where Mark English, John's dad, took us aside, and he was trying to teach us how to turn an edge. So when you get like an edge in fabric, and you get the sharp edge that then gradates out to a nice soft edge until it meets up against another hard edge, and hopefully. You, if if you don't know yet, that'll be something in your training to look to learn. And if you know what I'm talking about, then you know. But um, so Mark tried to teach it to us, and it was just one of these things. Like we weren't ready. We just we weren't. Uh, the, at least several of us that were listening to this, Mark was perfectly clear. It wasn't any deficiency in what he was doing. We just didn't get it. And then the next summer. I was working on a piece and Chris Payne came over and was like, can I work on your piece for like 30 seconds? And it was like, yeah. And he goes, let me show you how to turn an edge. And as he did it, it literally dawned on me. I'm like, this is that thing Mark was talking about last <laughs> summer. You know, like it just completely crystallized right in that moment. And, you know, it's like that whole, I don't know, I'm going to get it wrong, but like some kind of Zen saying of like, you know, I, the student was not ready yet, you know, like, and when the student is ready, the teacher appears, like the master appears, right? You know, so all of a sudden in that moment, Chris, Chris knew like, it, now you're ready for this, you know, and that, yeah. that is one moment I think of all the time that um, it was one of many moments and it's not like suddenly, oh, okay, well now I have an illustration career. It wasn't that, you know, but, but it was a pivotal teaching moment um of grasping an important concept that uh i think about it to this day think about it all the time that that happened to me so many different times where i'll be alone in my studio like when i i mean in my early 20s and trying to figure things out and then it'd be like oh god that's what they meant yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. i can't tell you how many times that happened to me that's what they were talking um I feel like that was like color theory for me. I did two summers with Illustration Academy and like the first summer I didn't understand it. And then the second summer I was, I was then just seeing it everywhere. Well, the, you know, the, the, the funny thing about like understanding a concept in art, you can't understand it unless you do it, you can do it. I mean, the ultimate is to be able to apply it. And so just like thinking you understand it and still not being able to do it is really frustrating. Mm-hmm. I think for me, um, I'm sometimes I can look at art like a sport, which I don't think is necessarily good. Like, how good can I get at drawing? Like, if I just do A, B, C, and D, and like learn this anatomy thing and such, you know, like my drawing is going to be inherently good. And I, it struck me that at one point I looked at some of the artists that were my favorite, um, like Pratt and uh, you know, Mark. And a lot of it was observation, reaction, and just almost a mode of drawing with good design. And it was less from my observation, I might be wrong, but it was it was less um, calculated to a to an extent, a lot of it was feel and just a motive. And yeah. that's hard to quantify. And I, I wanted to like quantify it, you know, um, and when I catch myself trying to go down the like, well, I'm going to handle this passage, which is informed by this 17th century artist, And, you know, like this theorem applies to this little moment over here that can really stiffen up a drawing, you know, that that's that's trying to quantify too much. And I think just I I just watch these artists and I have to constantly remember myself or remind myself about just the feel and trusting yourself, um, which takes a lot of trust. But um, that was, that was big for me and something that I I'm probably going to spend my whole career exploring. Everybody really quickly. I just want to say, um, please start posting your work. We're at the end of our, uh, we're, we're rounding out the end of the night. So please start sharing it now. We're going to keep drawing for a few more minutes, but um, start posting. So it's hashtag hive alley, like tornado alley, hive alley, um, hashtag drawing hive and add visual arts passage. I'm going to pull up Instagram. We're going to see what everybody drew tonight. So, but start posting now, because if you wait, it's just, it ain't, it ain't going to work out. Francis, we were all lucky to see a group of really good, mature artists that did things in front of us and kind of brought reality to it. 
and and it's like number one it like verified it could be done but there was something there was like this decision making going on why they were demoing something that was it, it was like a mystery um it's like how are they making all those decisions that quickly and effortlessly and um and you know, it it just made me respect the people the people even more. You know, it's just like, my God, these the, the artists were so good, and all the effort put into coming up with a a personal language mm -hmm. was was prioritized and realized that that the the satisfaction in that versus just you know being able to reproduce something was when you're on like a teenager like that seems like the ultimate climax of the art goal but watching someone so confidently speak in their own visual language like oh I get it that's at least for me and what I see value in like that's kind of the the top of the mountain um for yeah, sure. that's what I got to figure out right yeah yeah that's a really good that's a really good point yeah how do I do? Me? Everybody, I have to bow out. I got to go pick up dinner for the family. But this has been super fun. Adam and Cassandra, great to meet you guys. Well, and, nice to meet uh, you. And God, Francis, John, Timmy. Oh, it's really great to you guys. dropping in, man. And you, really wonderful having you, Scott. Everybody, just so you know, um, Scott now owes us a Scott Anderson night. And so we're going to have you on yeah. soon, Scott. I hope yeah. we can. We'll, we'll figure it out. All right. Good to see you, man. Bye. Thanks, Scott. Great privilege. Yeah. yeah. Good to see you all. Have a nice night. Bye bye. Hey, Scott, before you go, mm -hmm. Lauren Penapento's on next week, right? Yep. I'm sorry, say again. Lauren Penapento's on next week with us. Um, oh, fun. And so, yeah. you, you, you know, we, we want to, we Open love to have back soon. Open door. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll see what I can do. Um, it's nice that you know still on summer schedule, so um, right. don't have any classes getting in the way. So yeah, I'll I'll try and make it. All see right. You. Have a nice night. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. Only a couple minutes left, everybody. So um, don't wait. It's gonna happen. Some really awesome artwork up already. Oh, I believe it. It's always awesome. Wow. So did anybody um uh think up any of those uh art books? I have I have a book of uh it's a Velasquez book. It's it's not like a big comprehensive one, it just focuses on like yeah. maybe twenty-four pieces, but in real in really in depth, like not just the art history side of it, but there's lots of close-ups to questions about you know his technique and the color he used and the way things are built up and like how fast or slow his background was put in and you know sometimes whether or not an entire element of the picture had to change due to Spanish politics of that week <laughs> um but it, it's it's lovely to get up close to to his technique because you know you're in this you know 16th or you know the 17th century like the world is very much about like glazing and scumbling and glazing and slow build up and lots of layers. And then there's other areas where he gets really immediate with his paint, um, depending on the painting and depending on, on, you know, the subject or the part of the mm -hmm. painting. Uh, it's, it's, it was kind of like a real eye opener to sort of look through. It's, so it's one of those, it's one of these books that I've had for a while that just never gets old when I pick it up. Everybody here's something fun. <laughs> <laughs> you did that that's awesome that's my cora dawson pretty awesome we got shared well done, cora. We got we got shared. Shared. Love it. they shared it to the discord server and i was like i gotta share it thank you that made my that made my day that was spectacular okay so books i i am really having a hard time getting past I keep reverting and going back and looking at my Bernie Fuchs book. Mm. I cannot stop looking at that thing. Um, it's an amazing book. Uh, recently, I just got a gifted a really beautiful book by the artist George Carlson, sculptor and painter. It's a, it's a phenomenal book. Phenomenal artist. 
All right. Are you guys ready? We're doing it. We're doing it's it. gonna happen. It's happening. Right meow. Yeah, right meow. I think it's happening. Okay, now it's happening. Or is it a tease where you pop it on <laughs> yeah, and then we no, all get quiet and then it gets... Yeah, <laughs> no, it's happening. It's happening. All right, let's check this out. Oh my gosh, yeah. All right. Good start. All right. Oh, that's fantastic, Jeff. <laughs> awesome stuff. Look at that chin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I love how you did that. Love it. Good stuff. Oh, nice. Oh, Randy. Real. That's cool. Nice. Which right, Francis, up, Francis, you might want to know this, but uh um your uh your young Padawan, Nate, was uh, he was one of our first guests. Nate Schweitzer. Nate is uh is a monster and I try to make yeah. him as good as that kid. That 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 kid is a monster. Yeah. That I was talking with Randy. I spoke with Randy yesterday and I was like, Yeah, I'll I'll let Francis know. <laughs> yeah, he was a great oh, first beautiful. guest. Beautiful. Really great uh, job. Really great stuff. Awesome. Great job. Oh, I like that you put it all together. Uh huh. Nice, Paul. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, fun. do you know what Ter Terry's doing? Iron Man today. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. 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 That's awesome. Very nice. Great job. Nice, wow. Leslie. Good stuff. All over. Everything's everywhere. Great huh? job. <laughs> really oh, nice. Nice, Padma. Very nice. Good gestures. Very good. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Good job. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Nicole. All right. Nice, Felicity. <laughs> Felicity, nice. Age 13. <laughs> wow. Oh, cool. Felicity's Wild. been drawing with us for four years. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's Those great. I love the perspective you chose on that. That's yeah. fun. We're all trying to get as as many crunches as this guy does every day. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, nice. Ooh, that's Later. lovely. Awesome. Really nice. Great job. Good plaid. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Nice. Really nice. <laughs> good job, Terry. And she's doing Iron Man. Yeah, hardcore. Yeah. Ooh, Karen, that's lovely. That's cool. wow. Really nice. Wow. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> Great job, Jeff. Ooh, lovely. Love this purple. Really is. All right. Great job. Open. Awesome. Love yeah. it. Always good. So good, Gary. Great. Always so good. It. Really found some lighting shapes in there to play with. Yeah. Lovely, Marcy. Marcy. Ooh, that's cool. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so much fun. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was nice. Oh, nice. Nice, Nicole. Nicole. <laughs> oh, that's stuff. cool. Really cool patterning. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Awesome stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. Good job. Good job. Great. Nice. <laughs> oh, that's fun line work. I like that. Wow, Padma was busy. Good yeah. Job. Yeah, look at this. This is what Jeff does every week. Seven panels <laughs> for years. <laughs> years of seven panels. So good. It's the comic book that yeah. won't end. <laughs> it's the Drawing Hype comic book. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful, Gary. Gary. Yeah. Nice. Great job. Oh, Peter, that's lovely. Wow. Man, you got light beautiful on that. <laughs> love it, Marcy. Marcy, I love those cheeks. Yes. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that's cool. That's killer, Paul. Really nice. Oh, nice. I love that. Great effect. Really, that, really is. Like oh, a tin type look to it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. That actor will buy that from you. Right. <laughs> I guarantee Tag you. Him. I, Tag I, him. I, I, I promise you that. Yeah. 
Really nice. Wow. Great job. Nice. <laughs> I love the little, like, yeah, graphics. Good stuff. Ooh, Oh, that's AJ. awesome, AJ. That's killer. So cool. Always so cool. It really is. Nice. You guys got some killer stuff. Right? You rock. How many people were in the on the broadcast? It's usually usually over a hundred over the course of the night. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So we usually see a lot of art. Yeah. It depends. That's what's so exciting. It's like the, yeah. they're all drawing along and I love to see how everybody else interprets yeah. it. Yeah, it used to be if politics are getting wild, the numbers would go down. But now when politics get wild, the numbers go up. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants a nice place to draw. Yeah, I yeah. It. It's, uh, <laughs> as I do. <laughs> yeah, so it just depends, you know. It depends on the season, you know. You know, when we got Nate here, thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious, as it should be. Oh, yeah. wow. Peter, so nice. Yeah. I didn't even get to that board yet. Great job. Awesome. Wow, Sally, awesome that's stuff. fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, Rebecca. Yeah. Lovely. Loving it. Yeah, sometimes, Francis, sometimes I have to guess how many people are here because it determines how fast I fly through these. <laughs> Julian, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I that's love so that, cool. AJ. Man, cool. I love AJ's work. So cool. I need to see the movie now just to understand who we're drawing. I know. And what is this board she's holding on to? <laughs> It's a, yeah, it's a fluorescent light thing, I think. Oh, um, nice awesome job. stuff. Hell yeah. <laughs> what hell, hell of a one to end on. Awesome. Great one to end on. Uh, this is such a treat. I love Francis. I loved seeing you tonight. Thank you so much for gracing the show with your, uh, with your presence. That was awesome. Yeah, it's a, such a treat that you were here. Buddy. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Francis. We need to catch up, man. I need. I want to come to KC. Um, it's it's been too long. Hey, anytime right. you come to Kansas City, you've got you got you've places. Support. To yeah, you got places. Yeah. Thanks, y'all, and thanks for everyone for you can stay with me. And I'm thinking you can stay with Timmy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so what will happen is is we'll put you somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and you never get so lucky. Thanks, y'all. No, and it was I also it was such I a. I love to host you, Francis, Cassandra, yeah. Adam, Timmy. Thank you. Scott. Scott. Yeah, yeah, it was killer yeah. having Scott here tonight, too. So yeah. awesome. All right, everybody. Have a nice hey, everybody. night. Everybody, fun night. Thank you. Oh, and before I forget, enrollment opens August 9th. Set your calendar. Good All job, right? Everybody, have a nice Going night. Hard. All right. Yeah. All right. Bye. <laughs>